All right, welcome back. We're here for lecture 21, where we're going to focus on osteoarthritis, and we'll make some comparisons and contrasts with rheumatoid arthritis, which we discussed in lecture 20. For osteoarthritis, uh, it's mostly a mechanical wear and tear type of damage to joints. Over time, and with weight support on particular joints, we end up with essentially some mechanical destruction, in particular, of the articular cartilage. It is also biochemically mediated, and what we mean by this is there is some inflammation that occurs here because of that damage to the joint. It does bring in some of those immune cells, like we saw in rheumatoid arthritis, that, it can, uh, that can, again, release some of those biochemical mediators, some enzymes, essentially, that can cause additional destruction within the joint. But usually with osteoarthritis, again, we say it is mechanically initiated, but maybe biochemically prolonged or biochemically mediated after that. Some of the findings that we'll see are what are referred to as subchondral cysts. Now, subchondral cysts, which you can see here, are essentially within the, uh, the epiphysis of the bone, within the condyles of the bone, that we end up with these areas that have essentially hollowed out. A cyst is essentially uh, a, a bubble or a, or a uh, sphere, essentially, that's hollowed out. So it is subchondral below the cartilage, and it is a cyst, essentially one of these empty spaces within that distal portion of the bone. There may also be sclerosis, and sclerosis is a hardening of the bone. This is uh, caused essentially because we keep having mechanical damage to the bone, we keep having extra stress placed on the bone, and as a reaction to strengthen itself, the bone may thicken and become uh, particularly hard. We may also see bone spurs, or osteophytes. Osteophytes usually occur at the lateral portion of the joint. Uh, and usually, uh, essentially, are just these small extensions of joint sticking into, or sorry, small extensions of bone sticking into the joint space itself. We may also see ebernation. Ebernation is essentially this polished uh, texture that you see on the end of the bone caused by this constant rubbing. It creates sort of an ivory-like appearance. Uh, and that ebernation causing that additional smoothness of bone uh, is also weakening the surface of the bone. Finally, you might see what is referred to as joint mice. Joint mice are actually small pieces of bone and overlying articular or hyaline cartilage that have come off of the end of the bone and are now actually floating around within the joint itself. So these joint mice can cause additional pain. They also contribute to some of what's called crepitus, which is something that you'll see on the physical exam and we'll look at in just a couple slides. Some of the clinical features of osteoarthritis, it does most commonly affect the weight-bearing joints, the ankles, the knees, the hips, sometimes the lower back, and what's called the sacroiliac joints, and the neck as well, and supporting the head. But in the upper limb, most commonly, it affects some of the small joints, actually, of the hand, usually the distal interphalangeal joints and the proximal interphalangeal joints uh, are, are uh, affected in osteoarthritis. In particular, when we look at those joints, we may see what are referred to as Bouchard's and Heberdine's nodes. Bouchard's nodes occur at the proximal interphalangeal joint, and Heberdine's nodes occur at the distal interphalangeal joint. In both cases, it's essentially an expansion of the bone of the joint itself. There may be some osteophytes that are seen on an x-ray as well. It's some of the same findings that we saw on the previous slide, but occurring in one of these smaller joints. Some of the risk factors for osteoarthritis include advanced age, uh, obesity, and for obesity, it's mainly because of the additional weight being placed on these uh, joints, causing additional stress and therefore additional mechanical damage. Uh, history of joint damage is also associated with osteoarthritis in the long term, especially repeated joint damage. A lot of times, runners uh, or professional sports people, athletes, uh, will get osteoarthritis in the long term because of that additional impact that's occurring on those joints uh, time after time again, during game after game after game, or run after run after run. Uh, they'll end up with additional uh, risk for osteoarthritis in the long term. A misaligned or deformed joint, which again could be caused by trauma or it could also be a congenital defect or deformity, uh, could also cause osteoarthritis in the long term, again because of additional stress on that joint uh, and often a mechanical disadvantage that's occurring at that joint. And of course, overuse and repetitive use of joints will again cause that additional stress.
A family history of osteoarthritis does also increase risk. Now, there may be other factors that contribute to this. Certainly, a family history of obesity predisposes somebody to obesity, and that we know also contributes to osteoarthritis. So it may not be necessarily a direct correlation just because of family history, but there may be other factors that are uh, inherited because of a family history that also then can lead to osteoarthritis. The diagnosis of osteoarthritis is primarily based on the history. Uh, usually there is pain that's relieved with rest. Usually it's at, uh, worse at the end of the day. And notice the contrast there with rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis usually had uh, difficulty with movement at the beginning of the day, stiffness and pain that often lasted for more than an hour. Osteoarthritis is usually at the end of the day, mainly because at that point the joints have had additional stress on them, so you start feeling more pain. People with osteoarthritis may also describe what's called gelling. Gelling is after they've been sitting for a while or haven't moved for a while that when they need to get back up, they feel some stiffness at that point that, you know, maybe they go to, uh, go to dinner, they're sitting for a while, and when they have to get up, that's when they start feeling more of that osteoarthritis uh, in their knee, in their ankle, in their lower back. The physical exam may have crepitus. Crepitus I mentioned before, and this essentially is a creaking uh, that occurs within the joint. A creaking, a crunching, uh, or other sounds that you hear when essentially moving that joint, when, uh, when moving it through its normal range of motion. This is contributed to by the destruction of the hyaline cartilage, by that smoothness of the bone, by those osteophytes and the joint mice that we mentioned before. They're all contributing to this uh, sound and feeling of a crunching. There's also usually a decreased range of motion, uh, partially because of the pain itself and partially because of some destruction to the joint. Usually osteoarthritis has normal lab exams in contrast to rheumatoid arthritis. And we often will do imaging as well uh, if the diagnosis is in doubt. On imaging, one may see joint space narrowing. In particular, you see over here uh, on the lateral portion of the knee, a bit of that narrowing, you see some of the sclerosis or hardening of the bone because it's particularly white right at that surface. It's also a little harder to appreciate, but we do see some of those subchondral cysts, uh, those areas where essentially we have hollowed out bone. Uh, and also, we see a little bit of a bone spur right at the edge of the joint here, too. Here's an example within the hand, and you can see, again, there's some destruction, uh, in particular, to the lateral portion of the wrist right here where the radius is meeting uh, the carpal bones. For treatment of osteoarthritis, generally we start with a conservative uh, or, or uh, not as intense treatment. This usually involves some physical therapy, particularly if there's damage in weight-bearing joints. Uh, weight loss is, of course, a mainstay of osteoarthritis because it helps reduce the stress on any of the joints that are being uh, impacted by osteoarthritis. NSAIDs or nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs may also help with the pain, including aspirin, ibuprofen, and acetaminophen. And uh, we may also use cortisone shots, which are injections of corticosteroids directly into the joint. Corticosteroids, like some of the immunomodulators that we talked about in rheumatoid arthritis, do help to reduce inflammation by impacting the white blood cells. Here, because the person isn't taking the medication and getting it into their bloodstream and therefore into their whole body, usually there's not as much of a risk of infection because it's more localized. It's really staying within that joint. But cortisone shots or intraarticular cortisone injections can cause very significant improvement in the pain here, mainly because of, again, that reduction in inflammation within that joint. In the long term, if somebody has uh, very significant osteoarthritis, uh, they may need what's referred to as an arthroplasty or a total joint replacement. This is most commonly used in the weight-bearing joints. We don't often do joint replacement in the proximal interphalangeal or distal interphalangeal joints. Usually, we're talking the hips or the knees. Uh, and here you can see an example of one of these uh, uh, replacements. In particular, this is a hip replacement. You see there's a portion that actually is going to go into the femur or the long bone in the thigh. You see a portion where it's going to be able to hold on to this head, essentially. Uh, keep in mind, the hip joint, much like the shoulder joint, is a ball and socket type joint. And actually, this portion right here would go into the pelvis. It would allow for the ball of the, uh, the arthroplasty here of the, of the uh, hip replacement to articulate with the pelvis itself and be able to have a nice smooth range of motion. And actually, you can see in this x-ray here, 
essentially the placement uh, of that hip replacement directly into the joint. You see again that cup-like structure holding onto the ball of what is now the new femoral head, and you see the larger metal portion that has gone into the proximal portion of the femur to essentially reconfigure this joint. In the next lecture, we're going to take a look more at infections that occur within the joint and deposition of crystals, in particular septic arthritis and gout. See you then.